God loves you and He likes you. We know this because His Son, Jesus, died for your sins and rose to give you eternal life with Him. This is the good news that empowers us for our mission, to love our neighbors in word and deed like God has loved us, to unite us in worship like He's united us to Himself and to one another across everything that might divide us, and to transform our neighborhoods and the nations. That's what we're all about at Cornerstone Church, Irmo. And this is a podcast for those who want to share in the sermons that equip us for this mission, but can't be with us in person. Well, as the choir takes their seats, I invite you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Exodus chapter 4. If you are used to the sound of my voice, it might sound a bit uh, snuffier than usual. It is snuffy. Um, A bit lower than usual. But uh, it's, uh, the irony is not lost on me that the week when Moses is sent to go speak and he says, I can't speak well, uh, it's the week we got to preach this passage. So uh, that's okay. (laughs) Because the Lord's answer is essentially, I made snuffy noses. (laughs) So go on and get to it. So uh, let's give our attention to the reading of God's Word just for the sake of uh, some variety in the service. You stand and let's let's give our attention to the reading of God's Word in Exodus chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 1 to 17. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, that they may believe the latter sign. And if they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. (laughs) Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the signs. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would rule and overrule in all of your word, Lord, as it's read, as it's preached, as it's heard. Sovereign God, do your work in our midst, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, whether you have kids or have spent any length of time with other people's kids, you understand that children, even the best ones, have the innate ability to drive the most well-meaning, loving, even-tempered parent to pull out their hair. Uh, That's not why I'm bald. It might be why my dad is. Uh, When I talked back or used bad language, I would get a spoonful of hot sauce, and I did it so often I built up an immunity to hot sauce. If I found a shiny button, like an emergency stop on a mall escalator, I remember that one vividly. I was the kid who pushed it. 
I clearly needed Jesus, and my parents found him before I did, and I may have driven them to it. Now, just imagine that not knowing me or my parents, you find little blonde, believe it or not, little blonde me in some public place, and you see my parents visibly, audibly angry with me. Now, not knowing anything about me or anything about them, not being a part of everything that's happened up to that point, but simply seeing this little kid and this visibly angry adult, I have a feeling that most people would side with little me and judge my parents for being sinfully angry. And when you walk past, you might say something like, angry parents, how awful. But what if you had been there the whole time? <laughs> Witnessing hours of my tantrums, back talk, brazen defiance, you might be surprised they hadn't gotten angry sooner. <laughs> You might stop to ask my parents if they need a hand in disciplining the child. And what if you had heard my parents calmly, thoughtfully, consistently encouraging me to obey, giving me warning after warning if I continued in disobedience? If you had seen and heard everything up to that point, I have a feeling most people would side with my parents and judge me for being sinfully disobedient as I often was. Now, with all the facts in hand, when you walk past that situation, you might say something like, patient parents, how wonderful. <laughs> Our passage, God gets angry with Moses. And you might be tempted to pass by and say, angry God, angry Father, how awful. But when you get into the passage, I think what you'll see is a loving, gracious Father going out of his way in all kinds of ways to assure and reassure his child that he will be with him in all the hard things he calls him to do. In Moses' case, abandoning retirement and going to Egypt in his 80s to be God's man, to bring God's people out of slavery. You'll also see Moses, who for all God's encouragements, just doesn't want to obey. And you'll see the passage end with a loving, patient father who reaches a point of righteous, understandable frustration and anger. But even in his anger, we're going to see his loving heart for the most strong-willed and stubborn of his children in this passage. And that's good news for me. That's good news for us. We'll look again at the text, three, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered, But behold, they, the Hebrews, will not believe me, nor listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. Now, we're, we're coming in halfway through a larger conversation. In the first part, Moses hid his objections inside of questions. Now, he's moved on to statements. It's a fairly uncharitable statement, too. They won't believe me, they won't listen to me, and they will say that I'm lying. Now, to be fair, the last time Moses tried to help the Hebrews, they rejected him and sold him out, and he had to flee for his life. <laughs> but if God says, go, they will listen. He says that in chapter 3, verse 18. They will listen. It's pretty uncharitable towards them and pretty brazen for Moses to tell his father, behold, look, your plan won't work. I, I, I know you're God and all, but I had one negative interaction 40 years ago, and I know for a fact that those few people represented the entire race, and, and no one will ever change ever. Whoa, whoa, Moses. That's what childlike fear response looks like, though, doesn't it? it no amount of reason, logic, facts seem to alleviate fear of a potentially negative future event. The counseling term for this is catastrophizing. Taking a future event and predicting the absolute worst, and... Uh, I don't mean to brag, but uh, I'm pretty good at catastrophizing. <laughs> I, I can take one future conversation and predict it will go so badly that I can lose sleep and have panic attacks. It's an easy skill to acquire because all it takes is the one time you were anxious and it did go badly for your mind to learn, see, imagining things going poorly really helped you out back there, didn't it? It didn't. It never does. It's a lesson that Moses never quite seems to learn, and I've been a pretty slow learner myself. But look at how lovingly and graciously our Heavenly Father responds to Moses' brazen, unbelieving, catastrophizing. There's no correction. There's no rebuke. God hears the fear in his 80-year-old child's voice and says, 
Okay. I'm going to give some signs for you to give to them so that they can believe. But we know because God's already said that His people don't need signs to believe. Who really needs the signs? (laughs) Moses needs the signs. Because Moses is the one struggling to believe. And so God graciously gives him three signs in which Moses is intended to be an active participant. Three signs. Think of them like all of God's signs as visible sermons that require faith and nourish faith. Look at verse 2. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, the staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent And Moses ran from it. What's this first visible sermon about? God is calling Moses to trade his retirement in Midian, his his support system, the staff that he leans on, and exchange it for an encounter with the snake, Pharaoh, in Egypt. Moses runs, as most of us tend to do when we see a snake or when God's Word is calling us to do something we just don't want to do. Or God is clearly calling us to go through some hard thing we just don't want to go through. But by inviting Moses to participate in this sign, this visible sermon that speaks to his fears, it's already begun to stir his faith. We see it on display in verse 4. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. Now, as much as I'm comforted to know that Moses, like us, was a catastrophizing mess of fear and unbelief, I'm challenged to see that everything in Moses was telling him to run, and he did. (laughs) But when God called his child back, he had enough faith to obey God's word and lay hold of the very thing he was afraid of, and it instantly became something supportive he could lean on. What's this this first visible sermon about? It's about God's ability and authority to transform something scary and serpentine into something supportive when you obey in faith. Now listen, if you love snakes, which I think is a a mental disorder, but if you love snakes, (laughs) and this is no big deal, uh, think of something that would be because it was clearly a big deal for Moses. More to the point, Like Moses, how often have we been afraid to do what God's Word says to do? How often have we run from what we know God's Word says is right? And when we finally obey in faith, we find our faith nourished and our souls supported on the other side. Maybe it's something like spending any time in God's Word or prayer it might seem scary to get started, but, but it is a staff to nourish faith if you will lay hold of it by faith. Maybe it's following the pattern of the New Testament churches and laying some of your wealth aside each week to give. Committing to give is scary, but it is a staff to nourish faith in Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides if you will lay hold of it by faith. Maybe it's something like singing. God's Word calls us to sing, even to sing to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It might seem scary because you don't like people listening to your voice. You can't carry a tune in a bucket. It's not your favorite text or tunes, but it is a staff to nourish faith. Yours and the person next to you, if you will lay hold of it by faith. Maybe it's starting to tell people about Jesus because you are afraid almost as much as you are of snakes. (laughs) of what will happen if you do. But even when it does not go as well as you hoped, I'm telling you, there is nothing like the act of sharing your faith to nourish your faith. Maybe it's something scarier. Maybe it's forgiveness. You have sipped poison for so long hoping the other person would die. Talked about that person and your wounds so often it would be like losing part of yourself to forgive them. It might seem scary, but forgiveness from the heart is a staff to nourish faith if you will lay hold of it by faith. Maybe it's asking for help. 
because you finally realize that you can't kill that sin by yourself and it is scary to tell people you're struggling. All you see is a serpent, but there's a staff on the other side. Maybe you're living trans or gay and you're scared because you know that if you surrender all of your life to Jesus, He's going to call you to leave behind so much of what you think of as yourself and your support But God's word calls all of us to die to sin and to self, and we are here to bear witness. Yes, there is a cost, but that knowing, trusting, following Jesus is worth whatever it costs because on the other side of death to sin and to self and trusting in Him is resurrection to new life. Many of us remember that fear But if you feel that fear and trust Him anyways, we are also here to bear witness that He will not only be your support on the other side, but I know the people here and I can tell you we will support you too as you come out of whatever it is you're in to follow Jesus with us. What's this first sign preaching? When you bring faith to something scary God's Word has called you to do, you will find something that supports, upholds your faith on the other side. And the sign is given so that they, we, Moses in particular, might believe and obey. Verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord, the I am with you, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. But God gives two more. Gracious signs, we we can cover them a bit quicker. Look at verse 6. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. So when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. Well, what's this visible sermon preaching? That just as God is able to transform something serpentine to supportive, He's able to transform something unhealthy to healthy. Again, it takes faith to do what God says, maybe a bit less than grabbing a snake by the tail, but Moses brings faith to this sign. When it's all over, I have no doubt he he finds his faith and God's authority and ability to heal nourished by this sign. The last sign is something clean to something contaminated. Look at verse 9. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. This last sign is different because it's not yet a visible sermon. God doesn't tell Moses to do it in that moment. There's nothing for him to see. It doesn't require faith just yet. It's also different because this is the one that's not reversed. But it is still a sign. A sign of what? When God in the flesh turns water into wine... The sign is to nourish faith in the one who is literally the life of the party. When God turns water into blood, the sign is to nourish faith in the one who will judge all those who persist in refusing to believe God's word, who persist in refusing to listen to God's word. Is there a subtle warning to Moses in this bloody sign? I don't think it's that subtle. (laughs) He's the one, not his people, that's struggling to believe and needs the signs. But even this warning, this implicit warning of of blood for those who will not obey comes from a loving Heavenly Father. See, the, the world's word says this, God affirms those he loves. Warnings, discipline, that's meanness, that's hatred. God's word says in Hebrews 12, God disciplines those he loves. Going so far as to say that those who aren't disciplined by Him are not legitimate children. This isn't even discipline. This is just a warning picture of future discipline. 
But all of God's warnings, even the most frightening, come because He loves us and He wants us to run to His arms with childlike repentance and faith and renewed obedience. While this sign of warning might have implications for the right use of loving warnings and loving discipline, with a lot of caveats like we, we don't threaten with blood because Jesus' blood was shed and so on, I think the best response to this visible sermon of warning might be this. Don't delay repentance when you know it's needed. Don't delay faith when you know it's called for. Don't delay obedience when you know what God's Word is asking. Believe God's Word. Listen to God's Word like your life and eternal life depend on it, and then live God's Word as best you can for the sake of your Father who loves you. Well, this proves a bit of a challenge for Moses. God's name, I am with you, didn't fully nourish his faith and alleviate his fears. God's signs did not fully nourish his faith and alleviate his fears. So Moses continues with these these childlike objections, and God continues to be a loving father to try and nourish his faith and alleviate his fears. Now look at verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. So in in chapter 4, verse 1, Moses says there's a them problem with their receptivity. God answers that. Here Moses says, oh, well, there's a me problem with my delivery. (laughs) What does Moses mean by what he says? What's the heart of his objection? It could be a fear of public speaking. As a modern Jewish philosopher once said, the number one fear of most people is public speaking, and the number two fear is death, which means that at a funeral, most people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. (laughs) Some of us can empathize. But, but he says his fear is not speaking per se, it's how well he can do it. This could be Moses pointing out a, a birth defect of sorts, or maybe a speech impediment. That would fit with what God says next, I know, I made you that way. This would also fit with how God tends to choose people with weaknesses, which only serves to magnify God's strength. So Moses, along with the Apostle Paul, needs to learn to say, I will boast all the more of my weaknesses, for his power is made perfect in my weakness, and his grace is more than sufficient. That's all true. And it's quite possible that Moses did have trouble speaking and needed more of God's grace than others to do the speaking work that God called him to do. But if you were able to follow along in Exodus since the beginning, does does Moses seem to have an eloquence problem or a speech impediment? I mean, 40 years in Egypt, 40 in Midian, seem pretty unhindered by his speech. Seems pretty eloquent when he's talking to the Lord, doesn't he? For a guy slow of speech, he seems to have an immediate objection to every single thing the Lord says. So what's Moses' real fear? What's his real objection? Well, context to the rescue. (laughs) Look at verse 11. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. So Moses says, My mouth doesn't work well. God responds, I make mouths and ears and eyes, and and I determine how well they work, Moses. Moses, I've got this covered. I've taken this into account. (laughs) As the I am, I will be with your mouth, and I will teach you the words that I want to come out of your mouth. So what's Moses' actual fear? Based on what God says in response, I think Moses' fear is that when it comes time to speak, he won't say the right thing and the right way to accomplish the right result. Isn't there some skilled diplomat that you could send? Isn't there an evangelist, somebody who specializes in this sort of thing that can actually make sure that it goes the way it's supposed to go? But this results-oriented, performance-based fear comes because 
I think Moses misunderstands the nature of his calling. And he misunderstands the nature of the God who calls. These are the two things that God's response makes so clear. The nature of his calling and the nature of the God who calls. The nature of Moses' calling is not to go and be eloquent. To go and really impress Pharaoh with your public speaking abilities. Your job, Moses, is just to go and do what you can do with what I've called you to do. Right? To till the soil when I bring you to soil. To plant the seeds when I put them in your hands. Maybe even what are the seeds? Moses, my job is to give the growth. Your job is just to do what I ask you to do as best you can. Now, we don't share in Moses' specific calling to deliver God's people, but we do share in a calling to love God and neighbor, to follow Christ, to make disciples as we go, to work as for the Lord. Maybe it's just me, but I feel like we fall into the same trap Moses did of of feeling like it's not enough to be faithful. We've got to be amazingly fruitful. It's not enough that I talk about my faith. I've got to make converts. It's not enough that I tell people about God's Word. I've got to use my powers of persuasion to make them believe God's Word. You know you've fallen into the trap of confusing faithfulness with fruitfulness when things go well and you get puffed up in pride, and when things go poorly, you get dragged down in despair. It's not just Christians, but whole churches and those who lead them can easily fall into this trap. Right? If, if only we did this or, or, or do this like someone else, we would be what? We would be spiritually healthy, God-honoring, Christ-exalting, neighbor-loving? No, so that we would grow numerically. Now, do I want us to grow? Of course I want us to grow. <laughs> we spent a year refining our mission and vision down to something to guide and direct leadership decisions. We're going to spend most of the summer right before worship equipping every member to be a missionary right where God has us. We're, we're modernizing and, and marketing to get the word out that there's spiritual life in this older building. We've got 1,500 people on our campus every week through local partnerships, exploring more all the time. Do I want us to grow? Of course I want us to grow. But God has not called us to grow. (laughs) He's called us to love Him and love our neighbors and make disciples as we go. Not to do so for some numerical or statistical or some sort of picture of worldly success in mind, but to do so with faithfulness in mind, with the mouths, the feet, the eyes, the minds, the, the hand, the land, the, the family, the, the neighbors, the skills, whatever it is He has given us. Now I hope this clarification of our calling, which is to be faithful and trust God with the fruitfulness, I hope it sets you free, especially when it comes to sharing your faith. Right now, you are blaming yourself for that one person who just won't believe in the Lord. Go ahead and examine yourself and see if you should apologize or you need to do or say things differently. But if you've done all you can, stop beating yourself up for not doing something only God can do. Even in your heartache, you can rest. And we can rest because the rest is up to Him. (laughs) That's the nature of our calling. It is to be faithful with everything we have. And trust God to make it fruitful, not the other way around. And Moses gets the nature of his calling wrong. He also gets the nature of the God who calls very wrong. So, Lord, your plan won't work because you didn't take my mouth into account. Child, I made your mouth. I made my people's ears. I made Pharaoh's heart. I rule and overrule everything, including over the things you think stand in the way. That means nothing can hinder my plans and stop my purpose. Not your mouth, not their ears, nothing. Well, Lord, your plan won't work because uh, you didn't take into account that we don't have as many people as we used to. Or you didn't take the the age of our congregation into account. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, God made our church. He made us. He put us here. He made the people that you can reach in your home, in your school, in your workplace, in your neighborhood. He made the nations. Is anything too hard for him? 
Do you really think His plans for us will be hindered because we don't think we have enough of this or of that? Do you really think His plans for you will be hindered because you don't have enough skills or health or youth or finances or influence? Some people think the idea of God's sovereignty makes us lazy. But if God is sovereign over everything and everyone, it ought to get us moving to see what He will do when we walk by faith and walk by His Word. Our calling is to be faithful. He is the one who makes things fruitful. And He rules and overrules everything. But you know who doesn't want to get moving to see what God will do? Moses. Look at verse 13. But he said, Oh my Lord, please send someone else. <laughs> then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. So let me pause right there just for a second before we end. Some of us get uncomfortable with this language of our father being angry because we had angry fathers or angry parents that sinned against us in their anger and we confused the two. But you need to know something about God's anger. It's always over the right thing expressed in the right way, and it comes at the end of a lot of patience. So sure, he, he's been patient, really patient with all of Moses' questions and moving to statements and then full-on objections. He's been so patient with Moses. But here's something else that you need to know. This is the first time in the entire Bible that describes God being angry. When the world rebelled in Genesis 6, it says God was grieved to his heart. He brought about a global judgment, but the Bible doesn't say his anger was kindled. In Genesis 11, when the world rejected God and tried to reach the heavens on their own, God brought judgment, but the Bible doesn't say his anger was kindled. From Adam to Noah to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and all their sins and stupidity, it never says that God was angry. So yes, the I am got angry with Moses, but it took maybe 2,500 years or so to get there. Now remember me as a little, little blonde kid. And what it must have been like for people seeing my parents angry with me in public not knowing what a pill I was, <laughs> not knowing all the loving warnings and discipline that had gone before. It would be so easy to pass by and say, angry parents, how awful, but they weren't. I was behaving awfully, and they just finally had enough. <laughs> not knowing what a, a pill Moses was acting like, not knowing all the loving warnings and thousands of years of patience with his people. It'd be easy to pass by this passage and say, see, the Old Testament God is always angry. How awful. But in reality, our God is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And that is good news for all of us who tend to act like difficult children before Him from time to time. <laughs> that we belong to a loving and patient and, yes, frustrated over stubbornness and sin, Heavenly Father. Well, the final proof of his love is how he responds in his anger. He doesn't let Moses have it. Even in his righteous anger, he gives more grace. As he gives Moses one more thing to alleviate his fears and nourish his faith. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the signs. Slight spoiler alert. Um, Moses does all the talking. <laughs> this is all God's grace to put his child's fears at ease. God loves him so much. He's been so patient, so gracious, so kind. Even in his anger, he says, okay, let me give you one more crutch to help you up, but I still want you to get going. 
Moses does. Aaron does speak a, a little bit, but soon enough, Moses is the one doing all the talking as God had called him to originally. And with that, take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the signs. Moses finally gets going, and we will go with him next week. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you. We thank you that our Father is slow to anger. And Lord, we just, we, as, as Pastor Tim led us earlier, we just, we confess before you that we have given you many, many good reasons <laughs> to be frustrated with us. Um, Lord, you can't pull out your hair, but Lord, we, I know in my own life, I, I, I have no doubt so frustrated your, your loving kindness, all your, all your kindness, all your graciousness, all your words, all your tenderness, all your patience, Lord, and, and I still, I still act like that little kid. So God, would you please forgive us, not only for behaving like little tantruming toddlers when you call us to do something, but God, forgive us for how we've thought of you wrongly. God, forgive us for thinking that our, our Father is just up there waiting for the, waiting for the shooter drop, waiting to, to drop the hammer, Lord, that the hammer was dropped on Jesus Christ. We don't need to fear your judgment. The judgment's already been laid on him. But God, the, the picture of your heart is so on display in this passage. Please let it sink deeply into our hearts that you are there. You are loving. You are patient. You are kind. You are the Father. Lord, for those of us who had good fathers, they point us to how wonderful you are. And those of us who didn't, Lord, we thank you that you are so much better. You are the Father we have always wanted to have. And we thank you that you have adopted us as your own dearly loved children. So God, would you now send us out to do the hard things that your word has called us to do. And Lord, thank you for all the crutches you give us. But God, send us out in boldness and faith. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Pastor Joshua Knott from Cornerstone Church, Irmo. We really hope that God uses the content of this podcast, this particular sermon in your life. If you were helped in any way spiritually by this, would you take a minute and review our podcast or share this particular message to help us get the word out? If you're able to contribute to the ministry of Cornerstone Church, you can check the link embedded in this particular podcast to find out how to give. And we hope to see you soon face to face.